Okay, so I think pretty much everyone's here, so I uh, we'll we'll get started. So as I mentioned before, welcome to how to prepare for the BMAP, um, a webinar from the Medic Portal. So just a few things as to what we're going to cover uh, in our webinar today. So how to revise and practice for for the BMAP, how long uh, to spend on BMAP revision, and in particular to kind of uh, give you an overview of popular strategies that we've used with our students um, and what has led to their success and then how the universities use the BMAT as well. So I will be talking about the scoring um, and how the, the scores are used within admissions and how we, we calculate your scores. And then we will also go over some BMAT prep advice. Okay, the, this is obviously um, one webinar in the series of webinars and to make sure that you don't miss any of the future ones, you can go to um, our website and sign up for the newsletter and that will keep you up to date with any further uh, webinars that we will be running. Okay, so uh, a quick welcome from the Medic Portal. So just for, for those of you who aren't aware of who we are, so we're the BMAT strategy experts. So we've taught over 40,000 aspiring medics. Our BMAT prep is developed by doctors and Oxbridge uh, graduates. And we've got a platinum service award for three uh, over three years with five star reviews. We're also partnered with um, the Royal Society of Medicine as well as other organizations to kind of help promote medicine as a career uh, to all of you. Okay, so who am I? So I'm Abe, I'm one of the senior tutors at the Medic Portal. So I've been with uh, the company for quite a while. So I'm also uh, a medical student at King's and prior to that, I've done uh, a few other degrees at a few other universities. In terms of where I'm interested within medicine, so my interests lie mainly in dermatology as well as artificial intelligence and biotechnology. And as a senior tutor for, for the Medic Portal, I kind of cover everything comprehensively. So UCAT, BMAT, uh, interviews, personal statements, pretty much every step of, of your application process. But in particular right now, um, the UCAT, which is coming to to an end uh, next week. And then uh, I'll probably be focusing mainly just on, on the BMAT until exam day. Okay, so when is the BMAT? So ideally, these are dates that you should be um, aware of. They're not too far off. So we've already started registration. So you will have to register for this exam. Um, it's different to the UCAT because you have to register through your te uh, test center. Now your test center ordinarily will be your school, but um, this year, the BMAT is also within half term. So some of you may not be, um, depending on whether you board or not, you may not be located in the same uh, location as your school. So you can do it at other local test centers and you can go on the website to, to find whichever one is uh, more appropriate for you. The 1st of October, that's when registration closes. So you've got uh, another few weeks before uh, that closes. And if you do want to register after that, you will have to pay a late fee, um, which is from what I remember, uh, quite a bit so try and get your registrations in uh, by the 1st of October some of you may be still unsure as to whether you want to do the BMAT I would still say even if you're unsure try and give it till a, a day or two before the 1st of October and make that decision then rather than pay pay the late fee and then the actual date of the exam so it's been brought forward from what it was last year so it's on the 18th of October uh, for this cycle and that means your results will be released on the 25th of November and most universities who, who use the BMAP, we, we tend to find a, a quick turnaround from when the results are released and interview offers coming through. So normally for Oxbridge, it's within a week or two of BMAP results being released to them, where they'll in, invite the, the first candidates to interview. Normally this side of uh, the Christmas holiday, so early December. Okay, so in terms of uh, preparing for the BMAP, so it's similar to pretty much uh, every other exam, a few tweaks here and there. So the first thing you want to do is actually understand and really comprehend what is the content that it covers and what each section entails. Then you want to kind of apply that knowledge and to check your understanding by doing uh, questions. So uh, that normally means I, I normally start off with untimed questions just to make sure that you've really understood or, or grasped the, the content of the questions. And then you want to consolidate that knowledge within a timed manner so that's when you you normally would want to do uh, either timed uh, questions on a question bank or uh, timed mocks to make sure that not only do you have the knowledge but you can apply that knowledge in the appropriate amount of time that's going to be given in the exam. 
So in terms of understanding, so section one, so how problem solving questions are phrased. So phrasing in particular, what you'll find is if you've looked at the section one um, questions already, a lot of the time, the, the underpinnings of the question, um, depending on what kind of question it is, especially the, the more problem solving questions or the puzzle based questions, the underpinnings or the, the way you kind of get the answer is fairly straightforward. What is a little bit more challenging is actually figuring out, okay, so they're the steps that you need to take to, to get the answer. And so that's what we mean by that. How to handle these questions in particular. So there is, um, you know, certain question types that come up year on year that you need to be really familiar with and how to, to handle them. The technique stays the same, even if the question does change slightly. And then the key critical thinking techniques. So that's normally the, the, the questions that seem like similar to verbal reasoning, but they're a little bit more applied than that. So rather than just checking for comprehension, things like assumptions um, and flaws in arguments or reasoning uh, errors, as they like to call them. And then section two, we'll cover what's being uh, tested. So it's important to know what's being tested. So this is your the, the science section. So it covers topics for biology, chemistry, uh, math and physics. And then section three, and so you need to understand how the exam section is marked in terms of the essay or the writing task and what the examiners are looking for. Because I think that's where there's a, a bit of a disconnect, especially if you haven't uh, attempted section three previously, is when you first see the questions, what you think the examiners are looking for based on the question that's being presented and what the examiners are actually looking for uh, are two different things sometimes. Okay, so in order to, to learn section one strategy, so you can ask whether statements would strengthen or weak can an argument. So this is normally uh, the second part. So se section one, I like to break it down into section 1A and section 1B. So the problem solving and the critical thinking. So this is more the critical thinking uh, question. So similar to verbal reasoning, as I mentioned previously, but way more uh, applied and advanced than that. So how to address these kind of questions. So you look for the information that adds a premise or relevant piece of information or boosts the premise that's already being stated. So that's um, for, for strengthening questions. You look for how reliable the information is in that state in the given statement is. So when we talk about reliability, what we're referring to there is um, normally whether the the evidence to back up the point that they're making or the the strength of the argument, whether it's objective or subjective. So objective, obviously, as medics, we want to be evidence based. So anything that's objective and fact driven is what we want to to pick over subjective opinions, even if they're of uh, experts. Does the statement support or undermine both sides of an argument and make sure it doesn't rely on outside information? So again, sometimes they will pick questions in particular around topics where they know that you already have some knowledge. But if you apply your outside knowledge to those questions, what it means is you're going to end up making assumptions or assumptions that in relation to the question. And often that will lead to an incorrect answer. You can also practice section one um, with our BMAP question bank. And there is that code there, so BMAP prep 15, but for those of you who want to say 15% on that. So this is a stereotypical um, section one question. So when it comes to the Scottish independence debate, the Yes to Independence campaign says people would be a hundred, uh, sorry, a thousand a year, a thousand pounds a year better off with independence. However, the No to Independence campaign says remaining the United Kingdom would see people £1,400 better off. In early June 2014, the Institute of Fiscal Studies released a report suggesting austerity cuts or tax rises would be needed to balance a newly independent Scottish budget, which could inherit a UK deficit burden of £8.6 billion, equivalent to 5.5% of UK GDP. Credit rating agency Standard & Poor's said that despite an initial downgrade risk on independence, Scotland maintains a wealthy economy. Rival rating agency Moody's said Scotland would likely have a, a ranking matching the economies of Botswana and Estonia. Um, which of the following statements, if true, would most strengthen the position of the yes to independence campaign? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you 112.5 seconds, which is exactly what you'd get in the exam. Um, if you could, refrain from putting your answers in the chat for now, but then once the, the time is up, I'll ask you to put your answers in the chat and then we'll go through it. Okay, so I've started that timer now.
So you've got about 30 seconds left. Okay, so you can put your answers in the chat and then we'll go through them. If you've got some answers coming in already. Okay, so B, C. Uh -huh. A personal computer is a multi-purpose microcomputer who... Sorry, my Siri just uh, thought I was talking to, to them instead. Okay, so the majority of you who have gone with B with some C's in there. So let's see um, who's right. So well done for, for those of you who put B. Can someone tell me uh, why they thought B was the answer? So you can either unmute yourself um, if you prefer that or you, or you can put it in the chat, but both are perfectly fine. Process of elimination, okay. If the deficit is less than thought, then the effect won't be too bad on Scotland. So it supports the yes argument, absolutely. So yeah, that is the, the rationale that we would use to get that answer. So again, you'd have to kind of look at, okay, which side you're arguing for. So you want to strengthen the position of the yes argument, and then you want to look at what's underpinning the strength of the other argument. So you know and try and weaken that so no to the independence campaign um and then it talks about the ifs releases the released a report suggesting austerity cuts or tax rises would be needed to balance the newly independent Scot scottish budget um which could inherit a uk deficit burden of 8.6 billion equivalent to 5.5 percent of uk gdp and so if we know that that has turned out to be much less that that makes a stronger case for scotland being independent Yeah, so yeah, you can kind of use any rationale. I always think process of elimination is a really good way to, to go about this. And then you can kind of be more certain or more thorough that your answer is correct. So rather than just uh, reading through it and just being like, oh, B, B definitely uh, strengthens the, the yes to independence campaign. Sometimes you will get two answers that potentially could strengthen um, the, the point that you're trying to make. And so you kind of want to assess them in turn as to, okay, so which one has the, the best information or the most reliable information or an objective um, evidence base rather than subjective in terms of being an opinion. So yeah, well done. That is exactly the rationale we would say. Okay, so looking at the, the scoring. So as you can see, there's quite a narrow distribution. So it, it gets narrower for some of the other sections, but overall, if we compare this compared to uh, the, the UCAT, um, it's definitely a much narrow, narrower distribution of scoring. So when we look at this, what we tend to find is most of the students, or certainly when I take on a student that I'm tutoring, we kind of set the expectation of what we're trying to achieve. And so normally we would say if we're at this mark of around five, that's what we would classify as a good score. And then anything above a six or a seven would be exceptional. As you can see, when we look at the, the scores at the top range, so the sevens, 7.5s, uh, so on to nine, it's very, very few people who achieve those scores. And so if we compare that to the UCAT, and it's not to say that the UCAT's um, easier, but if, if we look at the distribution, especially with the interim um, scores that have just been released, we tend to find that there are more candidates who can sometimes get, you know, 850, 870, 890 in a particular section, and that's becoming more increasingly common. With the BMAT, that's not some an expectation that we, we like to set. So when I sit down with my students first, I'll say, look, like, even if you did really well in the UCAT, the BMAT is 
different in the sense that it's not just an aptitude test, it's a test of knowledge as well. And in terms of the scoring, that the bell curve is, is much tighter. And so what we're trying to aim for is to be, you know, as close to 5.5 or a 6 to make sure that it's a really strong score. Obviously, we can aim for higher if that's going to be possible, but I don't want to set the I don't want them to set the expectation or you guys set the expectation of, oh, I need to be at a, a seven. Uh, to get an interview or to be successful as you can see not many people get a seven and if you think of the BMAT it's more because it's more knowledge based it's more of an applied test and especially for the universities that uh, look for the BMAT they, they tend to be more academic and so or tend to be the ones that attract people who are, are stronger academics and so that's why it's already a bell curve within a bell curve we see only the strongest candidates applying to medicine sit the BMAT and then within that we see this distribution uh, or quite a tight distribution of scores uh, across the board. So revising science for, for section two. So I think for the majority of you, um, you will have biology and chemistry A levels. So in terms of the science for section two, people tend to, to focus or, or lean towards physics because you may not have revisited uh, visited that since uh, GCSE. Everything is at GCSE level, even your biology and chemistry. It's that obviously if you've carried that forward to bio and chem A levels, then the likelihood is you've still retained familiarity with the subject matter. So for example, with wave properties, you need to understand the transfer of energy without net movement of matter, know and understand transverse and longitudinal waves and their properties. Examples of waves, including uh, electromagnetic waves and sound, understand the terms, amplitude, wavelength, frequency, and period, and know and be able to apply frequency equals period one and F equals um, T. I'm pretty sure that's meant to be one over T. Um, but yeah, so you need to know the relevant um, theory behind it, but you also, more importantly, uh, need to know the application. And both are quite crucial because the section two questions in particular, it's going to be vital and they that you know that information because they will expect you to be absolutely fluent. And so we tend to find that students who have uh, stronger scores in section two are the ones that know both aspects, so the theory and the application. It is a lot of equations, unfortunately, not just for physics uh, across the board, you, you're going to need to know a lot of equations, but like I say, ideally, that it, that's just carrying on from what you already know or just refreshing what you have to know. Okay. So this is an example of a section two question. So again, um, for section two, the, the timing is reduced. So because they expect you to have some sort of fluency and knowledge, of the question, your timing is actually only 66 seconds. So I'm going to give you 66 seconds to go through this question. Um, well, I'll make it 70. Uh, and so after that, we'll, we'll go through it together. So I'll start the timer now. You've got about 20 seconds left. Okay, you can put your answers in the chat. Okay, so I think everyone's gone for, for D. Okay, any other answers before we go through it? Okay, E. Let's have a look who's right. 
So well done. E is the, the correct answer. So this is kind of what I was talking about. Not only do you need to have knowledge of, of the waves, but you also need to, in this case, to know the, the wavelength equation in order to, to calculate it, to know that E is correct. For, for people who put D, remember amplitude of the wave is from the baseline to either the peak or the trough. It's not actually from the peak itself to the trough, okay? And that is actually really, really common. So it's, it's annoying how much they actually do this, but um, they kind of make it so that they will focus on particular terminology and hope that you're not gonna be paying attention to the details because it is still fairly time pressured. And so here, when you see the wave amplitude, you kind of look at it and think, okay, um, it, it, it is the difference between the peak and the trough. And you kind of, even if you envisage that, you think, yeah, that, that sounds about right, but actually officially it's from the baseline to, to either the peak or the trough, not both. Okay. So when we look at scoring, so as you can see, section two has an even tighter distribution of, of scores. So if we kind of draw the bell curve, we can see that majority of candidates actually do better in, in this section. So, and again, as you can see, candidates who are scoring 5.5 and above is very few. And so again, that's kind of where uh, I try and aim um, to, to put my stu students into above that 5.5 um, or around the 5.56 mark to, to be fairly confident that they're, you know, gonna do really well in the exam. Um, but, you know, as we look, we can see the, the amount of students um, that can achieve a 7.5, for example, or above, it is very, very few. Okay, sorry. Okay, we're gonna go on to uh, section three. So this is the, the writing task or the essay section as it's normally known as. Um, and this is more about getting used to the format. So when you look at the questions, you might think actually, you know, um, each question is different. They always use a different quote or a different statement to, to ask you to write an essay, but how you actually answer that essay is very formulaic and it's the same format all the time um, or pretty much all the time. You're gonna be asked to do just you know a number of uh, tasks. So understand um, the types of questions that you'll be asked. So either statement questions or um, they'll have quotations. Outside knowledge is really helpful, even if it's not required. So some, especially when you're trying to make a point. So often they'll give you a statement or a quote, you have to explain it, or you, and then you have to argue either for or against it. And then based on that, if they've asked you to kind of argue for it or against it, to highlight your points, I would, you, you don't want to make stuff up um, because uh, exam markers can fact check. They are allowed to spend time fact checking. So please don't make up any facts. You don't have to be precise. And, you know, for example, if you put the NHS budget was 285 million and it was 282, you wouldn't be marked down for that. But if you kind of, you know, made up that figure in general and it was no any of the actual figure, then that's something that they would potentially take into account. But other outside knowledge that you have that kind of strengthens your point is going to be really useful. That normally prompts my students to ask me, well, do I need to uh, study particular topics, or do I need to memorize particular stats uh, to use in these essays? And I always say no. Unfortunately, it's we never can predict what the topic is going to be. It's not always even medically related. If some of you have seen past papers, you know that that's not the case. Some of them can be quite broad, and that's on purpose so that we can kind of see your interpretation in terms of how you interpret the statement or, or the quotation and kind of how you would argue for or against it. So outside knowledge is great. Um, you can, you know, read widely in general, um, but I wouldn't be able to recommend specific topics that you uh, want to read or cover. So I, I have people who, who always say, well, it always seems to be a philosopher's quote, uh, should I take a course in philosophy? And I just don't think with the limited amount of time that you have um, studying for the BMAT amongst your other um, extracurricular activities, your academic stuff, as well as, you know, your UCAS form is going to be sent off three days before the, the BMAT. There's not much time uh, in most cases for you to kind of then spend that time learning philosophy. Okay, before practicing with questions properly, try planning some out. So I find that quite useful um, to do with my students as well. So I normally get get them to do at least one essay 
untimed where they plan it out first and then they write it out. Um, the reason why I asked them to plan it or why you should plan it out first is just to make sure that A, you've really understood the question and you've kind of mapped out your answer to fit how the question has been asked. And then B, you can also assess your points before you start writing them up. And even in the exam, I normally recommend planning your essay before going into writing it straight away. It just normally offers better readability. Okay. And as it says there, so you can learn secret essay strategies in our BMAT course. Um, so that's one of the, the courses that I, I teach, uh, which is normally online or we can do it in person as well. And there's a code there if you want to save 15%. So in terms of looking at the, the questions, so this is a, uh, these are examples of, of the questions I was talking to. Uh, talking about sorry so the medical profession after all deals partly with guesswork we do not deal in absolutes so that's why paul beeson who's a, a doctor explain what this statement means argue that there are times where when the medical profession does deal with absolutes to what extent do you agree that the medical profession deals partly with guesswork and then the other uh, example is financial incentives should be offered to, te uh, to teachers from schools that perform well in standardized tests. Explain what this statement means, argue to the contrary, and to what extent do you agree with this statement? So whilst you may think, okay, well, there are two different questions, one's related to medicine, one's not, um, that is true, but essentially what you're being asked to do, and this is where I meant about the formulaic nature of these essay questions, it is the same. So you're always gonna do some sort of form of explaining. So that's the, the first thing that you kind of wanna address. So explain what your interpretation of that quote means. And that will be slightly different. There is scope for, for interpretation, obviously from student to student, if we feel like it's outside of the scope. So as an examiner, if we feel like when we're looking at the essay and we look at the quote and your interpretation is so far beyond what we think is reasonable, then the, the, there's an issue in terms of marks. But normally, as long as it's, you know, interpreted correctly um, or appropriately, you will get the marks or it won't negate um, the marks. Argue. So again, some as I mentioned, you're either going to be asked to do one of three things, so argue for the statement or quote, argue against the statement or the quote, or sometimes as well, they will say argue um, for and against uh, the quote or, or the statement. And so in that case, what we normally call that is your objective argument. So that is where you want to be very um, fact-based and almost write it like a, a research paper and straight your arguments for when you clearly, um, when you clearly can give examples of where the statement is incorrect or is correct, depending on what's being asked. And then they'll ask something along the lines of, to what extent do you agree? And so by asking you, that is your subjective argument. And so that's where you kind of have the ability to see or balance out the, the question or the statement. So if they're asking you to argue the contrary, you can then provide points for, and then give a balanced conclusion as to, you know, sometimes the statement's right and sometimes the statement's wrong. I know in academia, they always say, you know, you want to have a strong conclusion and, you know, you want to land on one part of the argument. For the BMAT, that's not really what we would recommend. Normally we find a balanced conclusion that can see both parts of the argument or the merits in both sides of the argument, regardless of whether that is um, your, your personal view, are the ones that tend to do better in terms of scoring. So don't always think like you have to, you know, completely agree with the statement or disagree with the statement. You want to be able to, to see a balanced view. Because obviously when we look when we look at it, the purpose of this or why they think a balanced conclusion is, is important, I always think, well, it's because we want medical professionals who are able to, to A, be open-minded enough to see it from another perspective and to, to be able to see both sides of the perspective, uh, both sides of an argument or a wider perspective than someone who's just going to be like, no, that statement's absolutely wrong. I, I, I believe that, and that's what I'm sticking with. Okay, if we look at section two scoring, so um, you get two scores. So you get uh, your first score from one to five for the quality of content. So this is mainly how well you've addressed the question itself. So how well was your explanation? How strong were your objective argument points? How well did you come to a balanced conclusion and give a subjective argument for for the statement or the quote. And then you also get your 
um, quality of English score. So that is A to E. And as you can see, most students will get within the A mark and you can make a few mistakes. So it's not that it has to be, you know, your, your spelling, grammar, vocabulary have to be absolutely perfect and spot on to get an A. You can make a few mistakes and still get an A. So it's not, you know, um, that rigid in terms of scoring. And, and like I say, you can see most candidates will, will get an A. When it comes to the scoring for the section three, uh, as we can see, three is normally the, the baseline um, or, or the cutoff for, for most uh, universities. And that's where most people will sit. There are some people obviously who, who get below a three and a 2.5 wouldn't necessarily mean that um, you, you're not gonna get an offer or you're not gonna get invited to interview. It all depends on the university and the, the scores for that year. But I normally say to my students, we want to kind of push it to three, three point five, just to just to be um, in a position of strength. Okay. So in terms of when we were talking about applying your knowledge, so once the content is learned, the best approach is to focus your practice by applying your knowledge uh, to specific areas. Again, you want to be mindful of the time that you have to prepare for this exam, and so you kind of want to really be quite objective as to, okay, where are my um, kind of knowledge deficits that I need to work on? For most people, especially if they haven't done it in a while, that's, you know, for section two in particular, um, you might think, okay, well, that's kind of, uh, that's physics, sorry. And so I'm going to spend a little bit more time on, on physics, getting myself up to scratch. And so that matches my knowledge with um, bio or chemistry or sometimes you might even find you know if you, if you didn't do math a level you may not have done math in a, in a while and so you might want to focus on that instead okay application will work best if you limit what you are focusing on so one step at a time I even break it down depending on what my students uh, timetables look like we normally break it down to a, a unit level so not only so for example it says make Wednesday a chemistry day where you just focus on chemistry questions we narrow it down even further. So normally through, you know, mocks and a few questions that we've gone through together, I will pick a deficit within chemistry or because there's, I believe there's about 14 units in chemistry um, that need to be covered. So within those units, I'll be like, okay, so today I want you to just focus on this particular unit because they're the ones where in terms of looking at the questions that you consistently aren't able to, to answer. So revise that first cover that knowledge deficit and what we should see is an increase in your score because you're no longer making that, those mistakes. Um, so again, depends on how much knowledge deficit there is. Sometimes, you know, my students will do an untimed section two paper and get an 8.5. At that point, that's, you know, fairly reassuring for us that there is no real knowledge deficit. So in that case, we can spread out our revision of just making sure that we're, we're reviewing all of the content within uh, the time before the exam and it doesn't have to be you know learning things from scratch or, or delving into it too deeply because the knowledge is already there we might just focus on application in that case um, or consolidation straight away depending on uh, how comfortable the student feels okay so consolidate so this is what I was just saying at the end of the, the last point so now it's time to get serious with timed conditions and proper mocks I normally do this within a week or two, but again, it depends on on the student and how much of a, a knowledge deficit we've kind of picked out. And so mocks are the final piece of the preparation and there's plenty of mocks to, to kind of do. So you just wanna be mindful though, specifications have changed over the years. And so please do not spend time doing questions that are no longer asked. And you can check on the BMAT website as to the specification changes and make sure that you're not focusing your energy on those questions. Because like I say, they're not gonna be in your exam. So why would you spend the time and energy learning how to answer those questions if that's not reflective of what you're gonna have to do uh, in a few weeks, okay? So you know the knowledge and you can apply to the questions. Um, to now, So now you need to make sure you can handle a variety of questions in timed conditions. I, what you will see, so if you were, for example, getting 8.5 untimed, the likelihood of you maintaining that score timed is going to be slim. And so you will see a decrease in your scores, but that's not reflective of the fact that you now have knowledge gaps. It just means that, you know, because of the time constraints, you're not able to fully um, apply that knowledge to some of the questions. And that's 
how the exam is designed. It's not really designed for you to finish with good timing. Same with, with the UCAT, the time constraints is part of what's being tested and how you prioritize your work. So when to prepare. So starting early is beneficial, uh, absolutely. Um, and you want to take a slow and steady approach to it. So four weeks before practice one hour a day, focusing on sections, uh, three weeks before practice two hours a day uh, and try full mocks. So a full mock is, is two hours. And then two weeks before, that's where you definitely want to be doing uh, two hours a day, ideally a mock. Um, and one week before, that's where you want to kind of, you know, with those final touches, perfect your technique, master speed and accuracy, and really focus on timing in particular. So I sometimes think, especially with candidates who are particularly strong, not only do you have to look at the answers that you're getting wrong, towards the end, if you've kind of covered all of the knowledge deficits, you also want to be looking at the answers you're getting right. And maybe you're taking four steps to get the answer when you could have done it in two. And so that's where you also want to cut down and save on timing, because that's the only way you're then going to keep your level of accuracy with the, the time constraints as well. OK, and then when it comes to exam day, um, don't do mocks on the day or the day before. Depending on how well prepared you are, some of my students, I'll be perfect honest, if if they've left it quite late, then I will say that they can do a mock but the day before, but only if it's in the morning so that they've still got the evening to, to absolutely relax and, and mentally prepare for, for the exam. And, and by no, I, regardless of even if they came to me, you know, a few days before, there's not a single student where I would recommend doing a mock before your actual exam or on the day, simply because you wanna keep your brain capacity and energy uh, for the actual exam. If you utilize that up in your mock, then there's less of it to use in your actual exam. And so I've never found it to be beneficial at all. So that's one thing I would definitely not recommend. Okay, so universities and the BMAT. So we do actually on our website have a full breakdown of the use of the BMAT by each universities. And um, that has been recently updated. We keep that updated for our students in general. So some interesting points. So in 2023, UCL will be moving to using BMAT scores alone to select students for interviews. So unfortunately, they're no longer looking at your, your personal statements or other aspects um, of your application. Brighton and Sussex, so last year out of the 37 available points for, for the BMAT candidates invited to interview scored 17.3 or higher, so less than 50%, and section three weighted higher than section one. So again, how they use different sections is it does differ from university to university. And so if you're particularly um, set on going to a university, you want to try and tailor your, your preparation to that. So for example, if you want to go to Brighton and Sussex and you know that section three is going to be weighted higher than section one, you might want to spend additional resources um, applying, uh, applying um, um, going through strategy for, for section three over section one. And then Oxford, or I would say even Cambridge successful candidates should be working towards a six. So it's not always necessary that it's a six, but what we tend to find is most successful candidates will be around the 5.56 mark. So again, I know there's sometimes a misconception, especially when you're first looking at the scoring, um, as to what, what's a good score. And some of you may have the expectation, oh, I need a seven or a 7.5, absolutely not. Um, we do find that most successful candidates will be around 5.5 or six. Okay, so in terms of just um, going through how we can kind of support you, so our BMAP prep packages, so we combine our live teaching with online course as well as the question bank, so you kind of get access to everything that we uh, can offer, and then you can add on tutoring uh, for a discount, um, and it's already included, it already includes a 20% saving, and you, you guys can get an additional 15% off with that um, code. Okay, so I think there have been some questions. I'm going to just go back to the chat and see if I can answer. How can you practice section three? They do not see a mark scheme. Okay, so unfortunately, there is not a, a mark scheme for, for section three. 
Uh, there is for the others, so they don't give the rationales, but they will tell you. So, for example, they'll say if you've got 28 out of the 35 questions right that year, what that corresponds to. Section three is a little bit tricky because obviously it's essays and we mark them separately uh, by our examiners. In order to practice that, there are some example answers on the website. So what I tend to do with my students is we, well, obviously I mark there their essays and then what I kind of do is because I feel like students don't always mark their own work as critically as they would mark someone else's I get them to mark one of the example essays that is on the website and then we compare our scores so I mark that essay they mark their essay and then we compare it to how the examiner marks it themselves um, and kind of look at the rationale that the examiner has pointed out with that essay compared to my notes on the essay and and their notes on the essay as well and so that's how you can kind of like if you bypass not having uh a tutor you can kind of look at okay well i read that essay and i thought it was a three or a 2.5 but i can see actually the examiner went with a four and they've given me these points as to why they thought that was a four and kind of incorporate that into your uh rationale as to what the answers are looking for unfortunately as i as i say it's, it is quite unfortunate that there isn't any further assistance i think there are some websites potentially and you can kind of go on some forums where people have been kind enough to kind of show their rationales for, for certain essays or how they've interpreted certain things but obviously with that you have to be mindful of the source of the information and that not every uh person will have um th the correct approach Um, sorry, there's quite a few questions coming in now, so I'm, I'm just going to go through them. How about Lancaster and Leeds? Um, I'm guessing you're talking about how they use your score. So they, I mean, they both will have the, their approaches on their website. I'm not sure about them just off the top of my head, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I would say I I think Leeds does have a cutoff for, for their BMAT um, each year, but you can double check with them. And actually, one other thing I would say is, and I think it's highly underrated, is if you're unsure and you want to kind of get that information, email admissions. They're way more forthcoming with information than what you would expect. So is it possible that we can have these slides shared? So we don't uh, share the slides, but we do upload uh, all of this content and videos onto our YouTube channel. So it will be available for you to view whenever you would like. Is there any way to obtain access arrangements for the BMAT? Yes. So if you have, um, if you, if I think I'm interpreting that right. So if you have any special arrangements or um, educational needs, so extra time, et cetera, that is done by your exam center. So if you already get extra time for your school um, exams, that's something normally you don't have to provide evidence for. Obviously, if you're sitting at a local test center that is not your school, then they will ask for you to provide that information before they can put any of those arrangements in place. How do you learn the science specification as it isn't part of a specification? So there, there is, you can go on to the BMAT website and there's a section to science specification that you can kind of map your revision to. Um, I normally like to just use it as a tick box exercise with my students of, do you know this? Do you know this? Have you covered this before? Uh, I am aware that some of you will have done your GCSEs during th the COVID period and therefore, you know, your learning for, for GCSE would have been truncated. So there may be modules in there. Uh, especially with physics that you may not have covered. So that's a good way of going there and kind of picking out those deficits and being like, okay, well, I know I definitely didn't cover that. Um, and we never learned that before. So maybe I'll spend some time learning that before tackling those questions. Should you learn the science knowledge from the specification? Um, again, I'm hoping I'm interpreting this correctly, but you would kind of use the specification to inform what units you should be looking at, but it's not detailed in the sense of it tells you exactly what to learn. There is a knowledge guide um, that they do, which is about 400 pages, um, and that is fairly extensive, but I've never found that beneficial in the sense of it's it's more money that you have to spend. And actually the chances are you've already got um, GCSE, chemistry, biology, physics books 
that you already own, or you could utilize from, from your school that give you the same knowledge. So just use the specification to make sure you've covered all those units. And then in terms of your revision, you can plan it. Um, interactive resources. I kind of like BBC Bite Size. I know it's a bit pedestrian, but I, it's interactive. You can practice particular sections and they do have interactive questions on there as well to really understand, to, to really test whether you've understood the theory that they've taught. So I normally will, will still use that and say, okay, well, before we clearly, if you haven't done this module before or this unit before, or if we've found that that's one of your knowledge deficits, uh, go to BBC Bite Size and spend some time on there revisiting that. What are some good websites to find BMAT mocks slash questions? Um, so I guess I would have to say Medical Portal. Um, on top of that, all of the past papers from 2003 are available on the BMAT website. So it's never normally a problem of getting the mocks. And like I say, they even have the, the scores. They just won't tell you the answers. So for like section one, it will say, you know, question two was the answer was D, but it will never tell you how they worked out the answer for D, if that's something that you're you're going to have to, to work on or work out for yourself. But hopefully now that you know what the answer is, you can kind of work backwards from there in most cases. Um, so yeah, that that's the only one that I can think of with free resources. Others, I, I'm not really sure, to be honest. How much do you think the gap between grades obtained by native and international students who don't speak English is? Um, it very much depends on the student. Section one and two doesn't tend to have any um, any gap, if I'm perfectly honest, from, from my experience, and I do um, tutor a lot of international students for, for their BMATs, even in the essay section, as long as, especially if you're applying to a UK medical school, you will have an English proficiency because that's how you're going to learn. Um, and it is an absolutely necessary, uh, I can't stress this enough, to have such a high level of spelling, grammar and vocabulary to, to do really well in the essay section. What we care about more is your content and in terms of that score, as long as the content is there, you will get the, the awards that you will get awarded the points that that merits. And then for the spelling and grammar, so the more technical aspects that scored A to E, again, um, it depends on the student and how proficient they are in English, but you don't have to be absolutely perfect to get an A. Like I say, you can normally make quite a few, more, not quite a few, sorry, but you can make a few slips here and there uh, before that grade is lower to a B. Are the science questions CCSE level science or slightly harder than A level? Uh, they are GCSE, key stage four. Um, what I will say is though, even though they're GCSE level, they expect you to know the GCSE specification with absolute fluency. So people might find that they're difficult, but actually when you look at the specification, they're still within the GCSE specification. It's that you probably may not have looked into those partic that particular unit in, into, in that detail. Um, would you recommend separating each section of past papers for different times of your practice rather than each past paper fully doing? Um, okay, so yes, at the beginning. At the beginning, I do think it's probably worth doing it section by section. So doing section one uh, mock and then you know looking at your your technique there and section two and section three towards the end you want to be doing full mocks because you want to you want to mimic the actual exam as much as possible is there any differences by applying as a graduate it depends if you're applying to a graduate course so um then obviously the cutoffs may be slightly higher but if you're a graduate applying to the standard five-year courses, then no, they don't tend to. But again, double check if you're referring to a particular, or if you're applying to a particular university, what their um, policy is. Sorry, I had some problems. Is this meeting recorded? Yes, uh, it is recorded. I, I did mention this earlier as well. Uh, it is recorded and it will go on our YouTube channel so you can find it there. Do you think it's okay to use the guide for learning the content for section two only? The science guide is, I mean, it's 
fairly comprehensive. If you're willing to, to use that as your sole resource, it covers everything. So yeah, you, you can use it. I just always find that you may already have textbooks that you used at GCSE um, that may be more you, you're more familiar with. And if you've already got them, then they're free. Whereas the science guide, I do believe you have to pay for that on the BMAT website. How would you suggest marking your essays? Um, so uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, a little bit tricky, um, but look for essays that have already been marked that are on the BMAT website. I think they do have like two or three and kind of compare how your answer would be in terms of the, the content of like how well they explained it versus how well you would have explained it. And then kind of gauge from that roughly what your marks would be. I've seen Imperial have a higher chance for interview and offers for international students, if it's true, why? Um, I don't think that is true, um, if I'm per being perfectly honest. How would you suggest marking out essays? So I think I've already covered that one. And then no, it's free to use the BMAT guide. So the B, there's two different ones. So there's the BMAT guide, which is the specification. And then there's the other one, which is the specific science um, one. And that's the 400 page one. As far as I'm aware, unless they've changed that this year, the 400 pages of uh, science content isn't free. But if it's free, even better. Uh, you've got a free resource there. And that is extensive. And it covers every aspect of the, the specification. But again, I don't normally recommend it because I don't know many students who are sitting to BMAT who need to learn all of the, the, the topics. The website section two is free. You just need to make an account. Okay. Um, that may have changed. Um, I haven't been on it this year, so I, I wouldn't know. Okay, so that's all of the questions, unfortunately, that we have time for, but I think there was no more left in the chat. Um, we will have further webinars and you can kind of go onto our website. So the medicportal.com forward slash newsletter, and then that will keep you updated on subsequent um, webinars. And um, yeah, good luck. <laughs>